to meet with him either individually or in your chaburos or get a couple, two or three or four chaburos together. We can go to somebody's house and we can just argue and fight and discuss and dig because the more you think, the more you absorb. And that's our whole idea of, if you remember, Zichok Harayam. Zichok Harayam, which is, somebody tell me what that is. This is a, this is a crucial, crucial message. Zichok Harayam, what we're trying to see. Clarity of a thought. Right. A lot of times we think we know things. We hear, remember the first time at the kickoff, we talked about um, the Mesila Tishon, where Rav Moshe Chaim Rosbata said that the more something is known and accepted to be true, the more we forget it and don't think about it. Right? Everybody here knows that if their heart, God forbid, stops beating, they're going to die. Right? You know that your heart has to beat in order for you to live. Now, let me ask you this. How many times a day do you think about your heart beating? Never. Because that's what's keeping you alive. But everybody knows your heart's keeping you alive. Think that. The more something is known, and it's true in terms of spirituality too, that the more you know that something is true, everybody knows that we're here to serve Hashem, we want to work on knowing Hashem, but people say, I, I, I'm learning halacha, I'm studying this, I'm doing that. We don't pay attention to it. What we're trying to do in here is bring these things to our attention all the time to the degree that they excite us and that they help us to achieve the beautiful in the world. We're going to talk about a lot of that. But I want to say something also. I met a woman last week. Um, we were just somewhere together. And I said to her, oh, why aren't you joining the Living Carbonated? She said, oh, I'm not a neshama person. I said, but you have a neshama. <laughs> yeah, but that's not me. I'm not, now, this is a woman who is, does a lot of chesed, a lot of kind things for people. She's always, always busy. She's doing all of that, and she's robbing herself of the connection it could give her and the motivation and the inspiration. And she is a person who has a lot of inside stuff going on. She could address a lot of that, too do this and find more peace and more joy and a sense of, wow, I'm, I'm doing something that really matters in this world. So I'm just saying, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're holding on. It's okay if you don't come next time, but I'm glad that you're here tonight. We have a chabura of people, a group of people in Eretz Yisrael that are, that are listening, that are getting together and talking about it. We have groups in New York. We have a group in another city that they, they, want to be part of this, and want to listen to all of the things, and want to do the chaburah. I know, and this is not me talking, I know that in every generation you need what's called the lions of the chaburah. There was a thing in the yeshivas in Europe, that there were always in these great yeshivas that were like world-class yeshivas, there was always a group of tamidim, a group of students that were really into it, and they were called the lions of the chaburah. Those people, many of whom survived the war, are the ones that brought the whole idea of Torah living to America and to Eretz Yisrael, and they created it wherever they went. You can be the lion of the Chaburah. Somebody has to do it. Somebody has to do it. If you remember last time we quoted Yechesko when he says, let me find one person that will stand in the breach for me, Hashem says. You can be that person, and we're not asking you to become frummer, holier, any of that business. Be who you are, and as you are, you can be the line of the Chabura. You can save Klal Yisrael. I know it sounds corny. I know it does. It's not corny. It's the truth. Now, here's the problem. And it's not a problem. Here's the reality, okay? The reality is we live in two worlds, okay? Some of this we've done over the years in other places, but now we're pulling it together so that you can have a step, layered step-by-step -step program of thought that can shift you from where you are now into a place of greatness. Greatness. And I am not over-promising, and I am not over-exaggerating. You all have greatness in you right now. Don't you want to touch it? Nobody just wants to be who they are with all the baggage and the limitations and the fears and all of that that's blocking us. 
that doesn't give us happiness. We're just asking to break through all of that. And I know that we can. These are Torah truths. These are things that our Chazal knew before there was ever any research into the brain. So we're going to put it in modern terms and we're going to put it in Torah terms. Take what you like and leave the, wet, the rest. This is a smorgasbord for you. I think there's a lot of good crunchy food here, all types, and it has no calories. That's the best part. And it's healthy. Okay, so we live in two different worlds. Please interrupt and ask questions. I'm going to try to cover what I'm going to cover. Again, I cut, cut, cut. So we could just have a very clear discussion tonight. I think there's a lot for you to get. And I hope that you'll have time in between to talk to other people about it. And if you don't, it's also OK. So we live in a world that's called a sensory world. It's the ordinary, everyday world where what we see is what is true. We pass the tree, we smell the, 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 the um, beautiful little blossoms that are coming out now in the spring. It's delicious, it's beautiful. We know it's there. That's the world. If you walk in front of a car, you get hit. Good things happen, bad things happen. It's a sensory world. It's where we'll, we take in information from our senses and that's how we experience life, okay? That is a sensory world. Many, many, many people live in the sensory world their entire lives. They stay in the sensory world. It's a tough place to be because life isn't always clear. It could be messy, it could be wonderful. Oh, you gotta take the bad with the good. Oh yeah, we're waiting for the other shoe to fall. That's the sensory world. As Jews and as people with Neshama, we also live at the same time in a transcendent world, the world of Neshama. <coughs> Our job, what we're trying to do here, is learn to live as we walk through the sensory world. It's like the trolley car. It's got this little wire that attaches to the lines up there. We want to walk through the sensory world that will make a lot more sense to us and carry us through with joy and pleasure and satisfaction and fulfillment and love for others by holding on by that trolley car just holds on to those lines up there and it zips us along. The transcendent world is the world of the neshama. We have it, we might as well use it. Now each of these worlds has its own language. I am hoping and I believe that if we have a core of people that want to live on a higher plane than they've lived until now, <coughs> we can develop that language, we can speak that language, we can think that language. And if you follow that thought through, you realize what an impact that can have, not only on us personally, but on the people around us, on our families, on our community, and on the world. And it's always been, always been in every generation that the majority of people stay in the sensory world. Even those people that keep it Shabbos, keeping mitzvahs, learning Torah, they never step out of that. Sure, I walk to Shalom Shabbos. Yeah, I make challenge. Yes, I go to Shalom Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur and I say Vidoy and I, I know it's important to be a good person. But, but they're missing the essence. And so in every generation, there's always a core of people who climb upstairs. Or at least hold on and they get pulled along by the upstairs. It's available to all of us. So we're not, we're not asking that we change what we're doing in life. We are just asking that we become more aware. So, for instance, last time we gave out this page called My Journey to My Greatest Self. It's a writing page. It's just a page of writing thoughts. And actually, we had asked that you do the first question together. The question was, what about my life would be different if I were more spiritually connected? I don't know if you had a chance to talk about that in your kapuras, but it's a really good question. And it's a kind of question you want to think about all the time. Not just if you're in a kapura and you're writing about it. Think about it all the time. If I was more connected to the language of my neshama, to the, to the transcendent world that's going on at this moment above us, every single moment, the highest level of our neshama really floats above our heads. It just floats above our heads. It's there for us to, to, to rise into. It's always there. So 
if I lived that way, what would be different about my life? But also, on that page, which I didn't ask you to do yet, there was a question that said, list 10 mundane actions I do on a regular basis that with intention are actually mitzvahs. So let's, let's, if you could do that this time, that'll be great. If you can't do it, it's also okay. Let's think about it. So let's take some ideas. What is something you do on a regular basis that you think is just what well, people do? You know, everybody has to do that, so I do that too. What do you do on a regular basis? Brush your teeth. You brush your teeth. Okay, why do you brush your teeth, Dina? Um, because I want to have good teeth. Why do you want to have good teeth? <laughs> so that I can eat, I can smile, I can um, live. Well, in the wood, your teeth get it. If there's inflammation in your mouth, all the dentists tell you if there's inflammation in your gums, it means there's something going on in your body. It could be a bad time. You know that, right? Sometimes the dentist will look at a person's teeth and see they have inflammation in the gums and they'll send them to a cardiologist. So they're training dentists in this. Okay, good. Very good. Um, something else. What, what do you what, what do you do on a daily basis? What do you do? Take my kids to school and pick them up. Okay. What a schlep. What a chore. Middle of the day, I've got to get in the car. To... But if you have an intention in your mind, I'm giving my children the opportunity to be in, in, in school. I'm enabling my children to go to learn Torah. I'm giving my children a chance to socialize. I'm giving them the skills they need for the future. This is a mitzvah that you're doing. It's not about self. This is about you doing something, you're doing it anyway. Think about why you're doing it and what it means in terms of building the world and serving Hashem. What's another action you do on a regular basis? Yes. Make my bed. Okay, you make your bed. By the way, making your bed is an opportunity to put a little bit of control into your life, to be a person that has order, to be a person that has cleanliness. Now, there is a book, I forgot what it's called, which talk, talks about simplifying life and not putting pressure on yourself. And in this book, they talk about Dafka not making your bed because why should you, mm -hmm. right? So there are all different reasons to make your bed or not your bed. The question is why you're doing it. If you're someone who feels, I want to create positive habits, a, a, you know, positive things that I do every day, one thing you might want to do is make your bed. And if you have one of those beds with all the pillows and the things, it might give you pleasure and a sense of, not when you walk into your room, you see the bed made with all the pillows and everything. That enhances your life. That's a positive thing. Nothing at all that we do is anything except by our intention. And we're going to see very clearly here that all of life happens in here, regardless of any circumstances. It's all in here, and we have tremendous power. Let's learn about the power, and let's use the power. So here's an example of if you want to take the time, two minutes a day, four minutes a day, put on a timer, call a friend, say, oh, could you answer that question? Any ideas on what we do like on a regular basis that really are mitzvahs, they're, they're positive things? Do you have any thoughts on that? And then back, you keep it in your mind. If the days go by and we don't keep it in our mind, we lose it. Every day that we don't make it a, a thought that we're focused on, in some way, we lose it. And so we want to develop language that we can say to ourselves that keep us in the moment, in the transcendent world. And that's what we're going to work on here. We're going to work on that. But remember, we have to layer this. We have to give information and approach and ideas in layer form, right? And then you have the three bits in between to absorb. Okay. So also, the idea is that Chaburos are an opportunity for us to keep the intentions and the awarenesses alive. A Chaburah is not a place where you're going to fix your friend and tell her how to think and how to live. I can tell everybody else lots of good things about how they should live. You know, we can all do that. We got lots of intuition and wisdom and experience. I could tell you so many things. I don't think I have all your answers, but I can certainly tell you how you're living wrong. Because <laughs> I know I'm doing the same thing. When it comes to myself, I don't have the answers. And that's why, let's say in the Chaburah, somebody says, you know, I really transcended myself this week. I said, can I share it? And everybody says, yeah, share it. And you hear a little transcendent action that they did where they transcended their natural impulses their natural reactions, and you, you feel inspired. 
And you realize, first of all, you realize that this person has a lot more to them than you thought. Secondly, you realize, if she could do it, I could do it. Thirdly, you get inspired by them. <coughs> they take their life and thought something so hard, and they transcend their feelings at that moment. It holds you more accountable. And, and somebody might have, and you might be talking about, listen, we're, we're, for instance, I, in the email that we put out for what you were going to do this week with your kapuros, you were supposed to talk about gratitude. Not supposed to. You could choose to talk about gratitude. And we said, talk about gratitude to the nth degree. What is gratitude? Why is it important? Why is it a core nida in the Torah? Why does the Torah emphasize it so much? What is gratitude? If you really talk about gratitude, you will realize that gratitude can bring you to a place of humility, tremendous humility, that it can give you, it can create loving relationships. It creates love. That it can, it can, um, it creates a new connection because if I recognize that you did something amazing for me. And it's hard for people to realize that somebody else helped them, you know? Because really, I really did it myself. She just gave me a little bit of help. So the humility comes in. I really needed help, and she gave me help. And I'm not independent. And I'm not somebody that doesn't. I'm not a rock in an island. I need others. And if I realize what Hashem did for me and what he's given me, what I've had in my life, what did I do to deserve this? We always say when something bad happens, what did I do to deserve this? What about, what did I do to deserve it? I'm in a beautiful room with exquisite human beings who are seeking God. I'm in a community of people that care about God and that want to grow. Mm -hmm. We have, Baruch Hashem, enough food to keep us alive. Most of us, almost all of us. We have clothing, we have friends, we have community. If we're stuck, we have people to turn to. We have some level of health or we wouldn't be able to be here. We have so many gifts, it's beyond belief. Do we stop to think about it down to the court? Zikho harayim. Do we actually talk about this to the degree that it excites us? Hislahavot hanefesh. We want to take ideas that everybody, everybody here knows. Attitude of gratitude is a great thing. Why? What is gratitude? What does it require of me? Do you understand how much humility, gratitude requires? You didn't really help me. You just came in for a few minutes and did that. I really could have done it myself. You know? You're not all that great. You know? I'm not all that lacking. I'm not a nebo. I need people to help me all the time. You have to be humility for gratitude. And we avoid that. And we avoid Hashem who's helping us every single minute. Because we have problems with Him. Okay. So we don't take the time to clarify what gratitude is and what it could bring into our life. The truth of the matter is, gratitude could keep you in a place of great joy all the time. All the time. But I don't want to do that work. I'm not a neshama person. Leave me alone. I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I don't want to have to bother to think about that. I'm aware of an intellectual. I'm aware of an empirical person. Why not think about gratitude a lot? Why not really think about it? You're in the kitchen washing dishes. Think about what goes into that. I have a kitchen. I have dishes. There was food to eat. Maybe I can look out the window. Maybe I can be on the phone with a friend. Maybe I can help someone by being on the phone. Maybe I can wash somebody else's dishes. I have the strength to stand there. How many people can't stand up and wash dishes? I have a life. He gave me a life. He's given me life. He must love me. And all of a sudden, you feel cared for and loved, and your whole attitude to life changes. So that's part of what we're asking you to do in the Chabura, that you can just take an idea and a thought and really think about it in a way that you didn't bother to put into before. It will change your relationship with your life, and certainly with Hashem. So that's an idea of what we're talking about. So please interrupt with questions. If I say something that you don't get or you don't agree with, please say it. Okay, now. <coughs> Last time, you got three Chabura pages. We did not ask you to do the three Chabura pages. I just want to show you what they are, okay? The first Chabura page was a page that said that when 
a few people do something, that's really great. But when a multitude of people do it, that's unbelievable. So I say to you, one person can focus on what we're discussing in this class. A chabura of four people can focus on what we're doing in this class. But when we come together and we have a group, a core of people that are dedicated to true service of Hashem and living on a different plane, it's an amazing thing. And then for those of you who have been here before, can I borrow your Kaylee? Can I borrow the resources of your mind to help me to be more aware? And then there were just some questions for you to talk about with your Chabura or answer for yourself. Do I want to be in a Chabura? What do I get from being in a Chabura? What am I worried about? Does it make me vulnerable? Do I want to share anything about my private life? It's not necessarily a place to share about your private life. It's to pound and discuss and pull apart every idea that we talk about so that it means something to you. So you shift it from the realm of the intellect into your being. And that takes a chabura of people. Okay, so that's, that's just the first stage. You want to fill it out? Fill it out. You want to talk about it in your chabura? Talk about it in your chabura. You want to take three minutes a day to scribble an answer without really thinking? Do something. Something to keep you aware. Page two. I can't go through it with you now in depth because we only have our hour. But at the top is something we talked about before that is said to us by a Navi, David Hamela, who knew human nature. You hate this. You hate Musser. You hate working on yourself. You hate having to do the work. You hate disciplining yourself. You know why? Because you're human and you're just like the rest of us. Right? So says Hashem, you take my words and my teachings and you throw them over your shoulder. That's good for somebody else. I'm happy with my life now. I'm a good person. I don't murder people and I don't steal. Okay? That's good enough. You give me a hard time. That's all you can expect from me. But there's more to life than that. So when you have a group of people, maybe somebody will hold you accountable and say, did you transcend today? Anybody in this group transcend today? It keeps you alive and awake to the idea of working on yourself. Then on the bottom, which I can't go through now, just tell you one thing. Rav Sheshes Badak Leish Lishna. Rav Sheshes was a shochet. He, his job, besides being one of our greatest in the time of the Gemara, the Tana Amora, I don't know if he was a Tana or Amora, he was a shochet, he would check the animals, and he did what shochetim do, he would check the knife with the tip of his tongue to see if it's sharp enough. If you ever go to a shlok place and you see what the shochetim do, they have ways of putting their thumb across the knife or taking their tongue to see how sharp it is, right? But this is just a metaphor. What it means is that if you want to get haraya, you want to get clarity of thought, from a, a truth of what Hashem has given us in this world, you got to test it with your tongue, which means talk about it. Talk with someone about it. What do you think, so-and-so, of this idea of gratitude? Can it really make a difference in your life? Is it really so important? Why do we have to be humble? How will that change my life? Talk about it. Sharp, sharp, sharp. Pull it apart. Listen to me. We are all slaves to culture around us. If you're not a slave or a servant to Hashem, you're a slave to something else. Everybody. That, that, that's it. That's it. You'll see that in the Seal of the Shrine. You'll see that in the Kobot. You'll see that everywhere you look. Human beings are always slaves, right? Our minds are shaped by the culture around us, by the people we live with. That, that's how it is. So we're asking all of us, don't do that. Choose. Choose what you think. Choose what you believe. Choose who you're going to be. Choose what your relationship with yourself will be like. You are not a slave. Your job is to become a servant to HaKadosh Baruch which is the most freeing thing of all. That's what's so ironic. We run away from him because we think it's so much work and such a burden and so rigid. It's just the opposite. So, I get off my high horse and I don't even know what I was talking about. <laughs> anyway, that's why I need a Chabura. I won't be a slave to my old ways of thinking, and I won't be a slave to the culture around me, which tells me certain things. And I won't be a slave to the sensory world, where I just think about what in this world and what makes sense. 
the transcendent world is not necessarily rational, depending where you're living. If your feet are in this world, the transcendent world seems very corny and a common that's just for the holy rollers. But if you're living attached to the transcendent world, you hear people talking from the sensory world, and you realize they're clueless. You hear it in their voices. You hear how they are slaves to their own distorted beliefs. Your ears will get sensitive to this. You will hear how they are so distorted and how they make it okay. To, I wish I could read you. I could read you a text that I got today from a young woman who, um, I, she, she just sent me a text about how she really would love to feel better in her life. She doesn't feel good. She feels bad a lot of the time. And she's working on it. She's in the treatment and everything. And she's doing great. But she said, I wish I could feel better a lot, you know, more often. So I said, I took a risk because I knew this would upset her. So I texted her and I said, well, if I shun's not in the picture, you're not going to get to that place where you can really feel at peace and serene all the time. The answer I got back from her was such a rationalized sensory belief system answer. And it was screaming, screaming, screaming. And I don't blame her. She had to defend herself because she doesn't want to do the work. She wants to be angry at God. It's much more comfortable. And then I'm not responsible because after all, it's his fault. It's really his fault. Look at the situation I'm putting me in. It's not my fault. Why should I work? Why should I be close to him? Don't cut because that's the only thing that's going to help you. You're here anyway in this world. You're going to be suffering anyway. Turn to him. He'll help you. Anyway, okay. And then the last page is a template to achieving vehicle harayim. It's a template to how do you take an idea and get to its core so that you absorb it from the intellectual realm into your being. Here's the template. You can do this with lots of different thoughts in your life if you choose to, but it takes mental work. Let's just say, here it is. Here's a template. You hear a thought. I'm saying things tonight that might be uh, irritating to you. Okay? I'm saying things that might be irritating, might sound stupid, might bother you. That's great. I don't care. I'm happy. She even wrote back to me. Oh, she's just trying to prick me into thinking. Yes, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. So here, here we go. I'm trying to prick you into thinking. You might really dislike the things I'm saying. Because don't I hate. I'm happy. Let's talk about it. Here are just some questions to ask yourself. Do I really understand the idea we just learned? Is it true that there's a sensory world and then there's a transcendent world? Come on, what does that mean? Is that for me? Is it something I want? Do I agree with this idea? What are its practical ramifications in my life? If I actually take this idea into my being, do I have to change? What's going to happen with that? Mm -mm. Why might I have difficulty in accepting it? Because I don't want to do the work. I want to be protected from all of this. Don't give me this holy stuff. I'm not interested. But after discussion with my chabura, am I a little more comfortable with this idea? Can I start to move this idea from the realm of the intellect to affect me on a deep personal level? Do I want to integrate this into my life? I'm happy with my life now. I'm not feeling the, uh, the burden of being close to God. Do I actually want to incorporate this idea? Maybe not. That's okay. Life is a process. Think about it. Argue with it. Throw it away. But it's still there somewhere. And you know it's hiding in the closet. Good. That's wonderful. We're very happy with that. Use this template for every idea that is presented in any of these layers that we're doing or in anything that you hear or read or learn. And you go from zikhlo harayim, from clarity of thought, to islahavot hanefesh. His lavus and nefesh is when you take the idea and you get it so deep and it makes such sense to you that it becomes a part of you and it actually feels good. Let me ask you something. Would you like to live a little bit in the transcendent place of life? Are you happy being in this sensory world all the time where you've got to compare yourself to others? You've got to measure things by different different standards and you have to be this and you have to be that and there's so much pressure and you don't even know if you're achieving anything and what's the point of my of my challenges what what is this that's going on why does life have to be so hard you want to say that is that what you want to live if 
feeling like you're never achieving, never good enough, never, ever, ever being what God wants you to be, whatever it is your problem is. You want to stay there? You can. The advantage is then you don't have to work. Because don't say, hey, you can do that, but it ain't going to make you happy. And it's not going to fulfill you. And at the end of your life, you want to look back and say, I live in this world enough that when I get up there, it's going to feel like home. Because if I live here all the time, and I get to that world, and it's like moving to a new place, I don't know anybody, and I don't understand the language. Let's start speaking the language here, and we're going to come home, and we're going to come. And not only that, but we're going to love it here much more. It's the only answer to life. There is no other answer. All kinds of good ideas in psychology. We're going to talk about some of them. I'm not a psychologist. We're going to talk about some of them. But the only answer to fulfillment and serenity and love and connection and being thrilled with being alive is here. Okay. Yes. What's the translation of this word down here? If you remember, last time we talked about, this is really important, it's not in my hour plan, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Well, you could just tell me the translation. Well, well, the trans there is no translation. Oh, of course. His labus and nefesh means excitement of your nefesh, of your being, right? Okay. So last time we talked about the fact that we have a combination of seichel, knowledge, brain, understanding, and rutzon. We're going to talk much more about this next time. Your desire. Who, what really excites you? Because you can never grow in opposition to your desire, your deepest desire. Sometimes we say, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that, I'm going to... If it's not really what set... That we're going to, this is next, next session, next layer. If it's not in tune with that, it ain't never going to work. So we have to put, bring the seicha and the ruts and the desire together. And when we do that, we have his love with connection. We actually are thrilled about it, and we're motivated, and that's what we want. So his labas and nevish means excitement of the soul or of the being. Which two things are you bringing together? Seichel, which is intelligence, mind, your yeah. mind, and your rutsum, your, your desire, your deepest desire. That's not, we, are, we, we talked about it last time, do you remember? It might be a good idea also, if, if you take notes, to read over your notes, because they just keep you in the thought. Okay? Again, you don't have to agree with them, but if you take two minutes a day to read over some notes or to look at some of your pages, I'm telling you it will uplift you. And we're going to have mantras that will uplift us in the moment. Because the moments will always be there. That moment of tension, of overwhelm, of resentment, of being hurt, of, of terror, or whatever it is, you have that mantra that will lift you. And the more you use it, the more it will lift you. And the more you get clarity on it, the more it will lift you. And the more often you do it, the more it will lift you. So if you're going to be the lions of the Chaburah and be the ones that are going to bring us to be aware of Hashem, that work you can do inside your head. Everybody has so much going on, but that you can do inside your head. If you choose to. It's all a matter of choice. Okay. Question? Yes. Can you just explicitly explain why I mean that place that kind of the most free thing? Yes, I can, but it's going to take away from the hour. <laughs> no, what is it that? Yes, so let's see if we can get to that at the end. Chris, you know what I'm ready. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take, let's take two minutes, okay? I have no God. No God. I choose what I want in this world, but I am a creature of this world. So, of course, I want to I have a good career, I want to have a big house, I want to have a nice car, I want to have plenty of money, I want to be famous, I want to have status, Want everybody to know about me, want to be perfectly skinny, size two. I'll go get my, you know, face redone, my body redone, whatever it is, because after all I have to look and and by the way, everything I'm saying there's nothing wrong with. It's okay to have money, it's okay to have a big house, it's okay to have a big car. I'm just describing when that's all that I care about. So that it's not a means to success in life, it becomes the end. Okay? Now also, I don't really know what to do with the things that are inside of me, so I've gotta I gotta find the next thing that's gonna give me, you know, that, that thrill. Okay? 
Well, let's see, in this world, you could do whatever you want sexually, so that's gonna give me a big, big thrill and lots of pleasure. I'll go do that. I might start with a little bit of vaping, a little bit of, of this, a little bit of that, because after all, there are a lot of pressures and tensions in life. Everybody's doing the, the CBD, everybody, nothing wrong with CBD, I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying, I got, got, got pulled further and further and further. After all, none of that is filling me up. So now I have to find something else that's gonna fill me up. I might turn to drugs, I might turn to drinking, I might turn to food, I could turn to, toxic relationships, but I don't have anything that's telling me who I can be. And I'm ignoring the greatness inside of me. I'm ignoring what my soul is longing for, which is focus, direction, commitment, hard work, disciplining myself to achieve something that's bigger than just my body. There is no satisfaction when you're not a servant of God. Nothing satisfies a human being because we have a soul. And that's the famous thing I said. I tell all my students, and I told you before, I'm going to show it right here really, really fast. Okay? They did a study, and they put children on a field to play. Here's the field. Big, nice field. Children are playing on the field. Interestingly enough, most of them stay towards the middle, and, and they're playing good. Okay. Then they come and they build a nice big fence around the field. All of a sudden they see that the children have expanded to play in all the different areas because now they're safe. There's, there's a wall there, and if they're inside the wall, they're okay, right? They know they're safe. And so now they're stepping up further. They're not afraid. This is what the Torah gives us. Hashem says, look. I created you, I know it works for you, and I gave you a spark of divinity, so when you live in the animal world, you will never find satisfaction. You'll keep groping and groping for more and more, and you end up self-destructing, and everything is about me. When you live within the boundaries of Torah, which gives you so many parameters, you can be this kind of person, you can be that kind of person, you can be this kind of person, you can be that kind of person. Expand yourself, be fully expressed, make money, have a great career, give tzedakah to others, invite people into your beautiful home, give, be out there, be outward focused. Oh, now I feel fulfilled and I feel good about myself. That's what being a servant of Hashem gives you. It gives you a purpose in life. You don't have to go searching for what's going to fill you up. Any moment of transcendence fills you up because that's what you're achieving, what the soul is always reaching for. Nothing will give you way. Your soul will never, ever be satisfied. It will push you for more and more connection. And a lot of our depression and irritability and, and being down on ourselves comes because we're not listening to the call of our neshamas, which is seeking Seeking, seeking, giving love, receiving love. The language of the neshama is love. But we're focused on ourselves. And here the focus is on me. And here the focus is on the other. Which is more fulfilling? Here I gotta go to the food and the drugs and the sex and what movies and whatever else is out there because I have to escape life because nothing's making me feel good. I wanna just have pleasure or I wanna feel good. Pleasure is beautiful. You're supposed to have pleasure. Life is about pleasure. But it has to be used appropriately. Then you get the greatest pleasure. Listen, I'm going to use a gross example, but here's the example. Within Yiddishkeit, sexuality is a beautiful thing, right? It's a picture of love, commitment, connection, building. It's, it's giving, focusing on the other, being one with some of the... It's so fulfilling, it's so wonderful. And then, and it's good to have pleasure, and Hashem is with you in this, and He wants you to be together, and He wants you to have pleasure, and He wants you to be beautiful. You step out of the world of transcendence. Sex is an animal act. So no matter how much you get, the more you get, once you take it out of that, that package that is so beautiful, you take out the pieces without being part of the package, and now all of a sudden, it makes you crave more and more and more of an animal state. And then 
that's not enough. So now we gotta go on to something else. Okay, so so it's not enough that I can have I could be sexual with someone of the other gender. Let me be sexual with someone of my young gender. I'm not saying yes or no, right or wrong. I'm explaining what happens. Now I'm gonna be I'm gonna have pleasure with someone of my own gender. Okay, I've done that a thousand times, but I don't feel satisfied. I know. Now I'll make it that there's no gender. I get to be male, I get to be female, I get to go wherever I want. And that's what we're living with. And tell me something. Is the world satisfied, at peace, serene, content, loving? Are our societies working? I ask you. But when you have a package that it fits into, then the pleasure is true pleasure. It's emotional pleasure, it's physical pleasure, it's spiritual pleasure. That's what's offered to us. Which would you choose? But it does take work, it takes humility, it takes submission. You hear? Does this make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Please argue if it doesn't. That was not part of my hour long scheme either. So now we're going to do this even faster. Okay. Now, here's, here's an important thing I'm going to give out a paper. I'm going to explain something to you because it's very important. We're sitting here and we're talking about, oh my gosh, this is really bad. This is really bad. Okay, I'm going to talk really fast. I'm really going to talk fast. Okay, listen. We're talking about an awareness of God and we're talking about serving God and submitting ourselves to God and the whole business, right? That's what we're talking about here? Okay, God, I'm going to be your servant. I'm not going to be a servant to my desires. I'm not going to be a servant to the beliefs and the cultures around. I'm going to be your servant. Why? Why should I be? Why? I don't know him. How do I trust him? How do I know? So what we have to talk about at the beginning of this whole process is our, who he is for us. Okay? Now, in the Cholos HaVavos, Perikvei, the Rabbin Abachai talks about, and, and some of this we've done before, we're going to do it a little bit differently this time. He talks about seven reasons why any person would trust another person. We're going to talk about three of them, and then we're going to show that there is no person that could actually fulfill these reasons for trusting in him or her. Okay, number one. Everybody likes to turn to a person who is very loving and accepting and merciful and compassionate, right? If you know someone like that in your life, you want to talk to them. Something's going wrong in your life, you want to hear from them and tell them, I am suffering so much, this is what I'm going through, it's really, really hard. That's someone that you would want to trust, and, and you just trust they're not going to say it to anybody else. They're there for you. They love you. They really care about you. Does that make sense? Okay. But if, you, if you're talking about a person, that loving, compassionate, merciful person, when you need that person, they may at that moment not feel so loving. Maybe they're going through something themselves. Or maybe they're not feeling well, and so they can't be there for you. And or maybe they have a limit to their compassion. And after a while they say, oh, shut up already. I'm tired of hearing you complain. And then, man, you really feel horrible, right? So everybody wants somebody that is loving, merciful, and compassionate. Hashem is all great things. He loves us beyond any conception of what love is. He is beyond merciful. He has mercy on the worst of us. He still connects to us and loves us and has compassion for us. So the first reason to trust Hashem is that He is so loving. And why wouldn't He love us? He designed us. He made us. He wants us to succeed. Of course He loves us. I look at each person here. Each one of you is a masterpiece. You're a masterpiece. He made you. He loves you. Second thing. Let's say there's someone in your life that you trust and you always want to turn to them, right? Now, suppose you call them and at that moment, they're on their phone with someone else. Not available. Or suppose you're in a room meeting with them and talking to them and they're so loving and merciful and compassionate, but their phone rings and <laughs> they have to pick it up and talk to somebody else. Or suppose they're sick and they're not available to talk to you. Hashem is constantly upset with you. He is available to you at every single moment without exception. No matter what is happening in the world, there could be a tsunami, God forbid, there can be an earthquake, anything. He is available to connect with you. He's always available to you. 
reason number three. We're not going to do all ten reasons. We're starting our our search, our layers with just three reasons. <coughs> Reason number three. He's all powerful. Anything that you ask him that he decides to give to you, he can do it. Nobody can distract him. Nobody can stop him. Nobody can dissuade him. He is all powerful. And I tell you, I have seen miracles. So have you. If you look around at the world, you look around people you know in situations, people you thought they would never make it. There's such a place. And sometimes I'll meet somebody five years down the line. And, Is this the same person? You see the miracles in their lives. It's in your face. He can give you anything he decides that's good for you. So let's say you will take this time of the next three weeks and you'll, here's the page of this. You'll repeat these things to yourself over and over and over again. You'll think about it. And all of a sudden, you will find yourself feeling lost and feeling safe, turning to Hashem. Even if things aren't going the way you want them to, He's there. He knows what's good. That's another one. We're not going to go into that one. We're only doing these three. Learn to connect with Him, to think about Him, and to trust Him. That doesn't take a lot of effort and homework. It takes some thought. That's all it takes. Now, the next thing we were going to do was to start understanding how the mind works. How your mind works. Because that's, you've got to start using the power of your mind. But unfortunately, the hour disappeared. And so that's the thing. You have to be patient because we have to fit all the pieces of the layers. And if you don't come back and be the lions of the Chabura, you won't get the pieces that could change your life. You hear me? I do have a mantra that I'm building towards. This? Well, um, the mantra is the three. The three that get me to trust Hashem. By the way, ladies, nobody believes this. Okay? Nobody believes this. You don't believe it. You might say you do, but you don't. You know how I know you don't? Because you're not living in total peace, surrender, and joy. So I know that you don't believe I don't either. I can talk about it, but I don't believe it. I can't sell it to you because I don't have it enough because I worry, I agonize, I go through my stuff. If I really thought he loved me and could do anything I wanted and he's available to me at every minute, I know he's there. I just don't turn to him. Maybe I'd rather be in a bad mood. Okay, well, I can't do anything because I'm in a bad mood. Oh, well. <laughs> Can't do that, can't do that, can't be responsible. I'd rather be in a bad mood. That's very human. I'm allowed to be in a bad mood sometimes and just not do what I have to do. Don't try to take that away from me. So we're not trying to take that away from you. We're just trying to put new things in your brain. We're going to talk next time about the power of your brain. So uh, we got cut short. I, I don't know you know, what, how we're going to be able to... We're going to do number six. And seven. <laughs> What's number six and seven? Class six. Class six and class seven. 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 Oh, whatever. But, but I'm just telling you, <laughs> this is a lifetime work, but it is the greatest, funnest, most connecting, happiest work you can ever do. Is there anything we said here that makes you feel down or bad or this is a burden? Tell me now. What was the burden that I put on you tonight? What burden? I can't have to give you oil. <laughs> have them and enjoy them. I know. Enjoy every physical blessing Hashem gives you in your entire life. Yes. I want to figure out how to um, how to reconcile things that happen like natural disasters with because we all live in our sensory world. We go about our business, right. and doing our thing. But then there's something that's like outside of that. Yes. And I, I don't know how to fit that in. Like, how do you fit in? Right. Tsunami, earthquake, what's happening in Turkey, like, 
And also, this terrorist attack, horrible things that happen, okay? So let, first let me tell you this. Lo machshav osecha machshav osai, says Hashem to Yeshaya Hanavi. Your way of thinking is not my way of thinking, okay? We're in a sensory world. We don't see the whole picture. We know nothing. We're pretty arrogant. We all are. We're arrogant because we think we know better. I remember one time when I was about 16 or 17 years old, and I had just finished, finished reading one of those Holocaust books. I was like obsessed with Holocaust books. Because when I was a kid, there were people who had parents or grandparents that were in the Holocaust. They had their numbers on their arms. And I remember sitting at the kitchen table, and we were eating supper. And I was in, you know, teenager, and everything was very black and white. I remember saying at the table, how could Hashem do this kind of thing? How could he hurt people like that? It doesn't he have any pity? Doesn't he have... My father, who was the kindest person, couldn't bring himself ever to do anything, even to patch a child. It was like so hard for him. He looked at me, and he was so upset with me. He said to me, you think you have more pity than Hashem? And I was ashamed of myself. How arrogant was I that I know better than him? He shouldn't make people suffer. What do I know? 17-year-old kid, 77-year-old kid. What do I know? I don't know anything. I'm down here. I don't see what's going on in the real world. I don't understand the purpose of the world. I don't see the progress that's being made. I don't understand what's happening with the different nishamas. But he does. So the first thing we have to know is that we must be humble. And the more we practice these three things, the more we are prepared for the little difficulties in life and the big difficulties in life. We must train ourselves in the easier moments. And not every moments are easy. Life is hard and life is demanding. But when we train ourselves in this way, you would be surprised what happens to me in these difficult moments where they feel Hashem's arms wrapped around them if they have trained themselves. People come through the most horrific things with grace, with dignity, with hope, we see it. So I know it's hard, and we do have to talk about that. We're going to have to talk about suffering and challenges. If we're really going to create awareness of Hashem, that's if you look at your at your page with all the bubbles, the thing that shows all the elements, that's your very first page. Look at what we're going to have to be talking about. So that's what we have to talk about. It's a good question. It's a perfect question. We all have the same question. Somebody just said to me on the phone today, from another city, how am I supposed to trust in a God who has a woman lose two children at one time, which just happened in the terrorist attack? It's inconceivable, it's so horrific. How am I supposed to trust him? It's a good question, but it's a sensory question. It's a sensory world question. It's not a transcendent world question. Because Rechaim Volozhin, the greatest of the great, had a town there, a student who was about 19 years old, and he was very, very sick. So Chaim Volashin said to him, he, he was going to die. He was dying. He said, I want you to come back to me after you are, or go to the world above, because he was a top, beautiful person. I want you to ask the Kurdish world, why did this have to happen? And I want you to come back and tell me. So Chaim Volashin, okay, a giant, the student who was going to go. Tommy says to him, okay, Rebbe, I'll do what you tell me. Guy dies. He had the funeral day, a week, whatever it is, I don't know how much later, he comes to Rebchaim in a dream. He says, Rebbe, I went to the first level of Shemayim, and I had my question. But then I went, they took me to the second level of Shemayim, and I had a chance to ask my question. And then they took me to the third level of Shemayim, and then all the way up to the seventh level. And there was no question. And he went, this is not true. and enhance ourselves in the world. Imagine yourself being disconnected and dealing with somebody who's difficult. It's going to be a different feeling than if you're living in this world. Well, they're bothering me. Well, they make me sick. Well, they're so controlling. They're not. And it's all true. They are really difficult. But can you love them? Can you see that they're struggling? Can you give them a little bit of what they need? 
Can you do kindness without expecting something back from them? Can you be like God? Can you hold on to that trolley line? You're holding the right hand. Let him hold your hand all day long. No matter what the circumstances are, he is there, he is holding your hand. So although we didn't cover everything that we wanted to cover, you had stuff to think about. I would suggest that you talk to Chabur about these different ideas. Oh, I'm going to give you one last page. I'm going to give you one last page, and I'll, I'll explain it next time, but I didn't explain it this time, but it's very important. Well, nope. <laughs> okay, thank you, ladies, for being here. Please come again. We will work on this together. Call me if you want me to do your Chabura. We can get 10, 15 women together and talk about these ideas more. Whatever will work for you. Good night. Thank you. Uh, you